Good morning, Breakfast with Bacon fans. I know there's a topic that everybody's talking about these days, and it brings a lot of ears and eyes, and it's the talk of the Antichrist. Who is he? When is he going to make his appearance? Is it really a person? Is it just a metaphor? Well, it is today's topic between my guest, Father Robert Altier, and myself. He is the author of the book, God's Plan for Your Marriage. He is also an associate pastor at I'm going to mess this up at Holy Trinity Parish in South St. Paul, Minnesota. Did I get it, Father? Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Whenever I don't write things down and it seems so easy, that's when all of a sudden I'll get tongue tied. Mm -hmm. So, Father, I, I want to just start. Thank you, first of all, for agreeing to be here. I know priests are such short number these days and you're always so busy. So I'm so blessed by your graciousness uh, with me on my guests. But this is a serious topic and one that is pretty close to your heart, right? Because do you want to tell us why? Well, it's uh, as I watch what's going on with the church right now, and I, as I keep pointing out to the to the people here in the, in the homilies, because uh, people are getting so frustrated with what they see coming out of Rome and the different things happening and all the corruption and everything, they say, you know, on on the road to Emmaus, remember what Jesus told his his disciples: it was necessary that the Son of Man had to go through these things, that the Messiah had to endure all this. Well, the church is the bride of Christ. The church is on the way now to the consummation of her union with Jesus, and that consummation can only happen on the cross. The church must be crucified, and the fathers of the church teach us that the most blessed Christians of all time are the ones who will be alive when the church is crucified. I believe that that's us, and in order for that to happen, then we have all these elements that need to, to, to take place. So St. Paul tells the Thessalonians that the Antichrist, the man of perdition, cannot be revealed until after the time of the apostasy. So that means there has to be an apostasy in the church before the revealing of the Antichrist. And so we look at what's going on again right now. We have a mass exodus of people and it's not just that they're leaving Catholicism to go to Protestantism, they're just leaving everything. It So in other words, it's not just a heresy, it is an apostasy, because an apostasy is the rejection of Christ and, and of, of God. And that's, that's what we're dealing with. People will say, oh, they believe in God. I always like to point out that St. James talks about that, and he says, you believe in God, that's good, but the demons believe and they tremble. So, so it's not, you know, it's, it's a good thing if people say they believe in God, but when you're not doing much better than the devil, that's, that's not going very that's, far. Yeah, not so, high standards. Exactly. That's, yeah. And so, so now, you know, as, as we look at what's going on, we see the material apostasy happening. We are still waiting for the formal apostasy, and that would have to come from the people at the top of the church. And, and so that's, that's I, as I see it, where we're headed that opens the way for the Antichrist to be revealed. And, and that would then lead to the crucifixion of the church. That's pretty clear. That's succinct. And I would agree with you that, and I would actually want to be, I don't want to be tortured or in any bad place, but I do want to be in this time in history where um, the greatest graces are flowing. And if that's what the church father said, so if we are, I, I praise God that I am. And then I ask him to give you and give me and give our families the strength to endure what it is to come because we I, do need to fight. I, I believe this is the single greatest time in history to be alive. I mean, if you were alive back 2000 years ago in Jerusalem, yeah, that would have been even greater. It'd be with Jesus and Mary. There were a very, very, very small number of people who were alive and would have known our blessed Lord and our blessed lady. This is for every single person on the face of the earth. Everyone has an opportunity to be part of the crucifixion now, to be part of the passion. And, and so what I always tell people is you know, the apostles, there was no way that they could have understood. I mean, Jesus told them what was going to happen. They couldn't have understood that. They didn't have a context for that. They, they didn't have the understanding. But if they would have understood, they would have handled things very differently than they did. Well, we have the advantage now of 2,000 years of, of saints, 2,000 years of theology. We know why Jesus had to undergo his passion. 
We know the good that came out of it. We, we wouldn't be saved if he didn't do that. So yes, it was unjust. Yes, it was a lot of corruption. Yes, it was a lot of problem, but it was all needed to bring about the salvation of the world. Now we need to take that same understanding and apply it to the church as we go through this, because people are getting upset and frustrated, as I mentioned earlier, as they're watching what's happening and seeing the corruption. And it's like, apply what you know about our Lord's passion to the passion of the church now. This is necessary. It's, it's you know, it's yes, it's unjust. Acknowledge it. Don't bury your head in the sand and act like it's not happening. But don't get all worked up about it, because it has to happen. We can't get to the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, which would be the the the, uh, the resurrection of the church, essentially, until we go through the crucifixion. So this has to happen for the greater good. And, and that's what we have to be able to see it as. So in that sense, it's cause for rejoicing. Yeah. And like you said, the amount of grace that's available to us, if this is that time, there there is more grace available now than ever before because it's going to be necessary. And and so that's that's the gift that we have. And and it's it's a total grace from God. Yeah, I do pray that we are there. So you said something that I think a lot of us pro- probably laity and, and uh priests as well are we we wonder. So if we have to go through this, if it's inevitable, how do we find the balance between fighting against the evil? And just kind of letting it happen. Is there a balance between the two of them? Well, there is, obviously. On the personal level, you have to fight evil because otherwise it's, you're going to give in to sin. Um, but at the same time, when you're dealing with the objective, we must always uphold the truth. Always in charity, but we must always uphold the truth because the truth cannot change. So if people are speaking heresy, pushing heresy, we have an obligation to say that's wrong. We have an obligation, not only because it's false, but for the good of souls, because it's causing so much confusion for people. I I like to say, I don't care what color cassock somebody is wearing, the black of a priest, the purple of, of a bishop, the red of a cardinal, the white of a pope. If anyone says anything different from what Jesus taught and what the church has taught throughout the, the ages, stick with Jesus. You know, no, the truth can't change. And so if they're trying to say, oh, we don't believe that anymore, well, either we never did or we still do. And and so so because, again, the truth can't change. So we, we have an obligation on that level to fight against the evil, to be able to say that this is wrong, this is, you know, this is corrupt, whatever it is. But then there's part of it, too, where it's way bigger than we are, you know, as as I pointed out, when these things happened with Bishop Strickland, I mentioned to the people here, said, does your anger do anything to help Bishop Strickland? Does your anger, do the people in Rome care about your anger? It's like, no, just pray, stay at peace. Yes, acknowledge the injustice and, and so on. But St. James again says, man's anger does not bring forth the righteousness of God. Yeah, and, and so so it's, our, our anger can't, can't you know can't equal god's righteousness so we have to trust he's got a plan so in those things that are bigger than we are that we don't have any say in yeah acknowledge it but don't get caught up in the anger just stay at peace and pray that's the absolute most important thing is your prayer life because you have to stay united with jesus so if there's something that affects you or something that you can straighten up for somebody in your life absolutely you have an obligation to do that when it's bigger than you, you don't. There's nothing you can do other than pray. What good is it going to do to be angry? What good is it going to do to complain? What good is it going to do to point fingers and call names? It doesn't. Just pray and leave it in God's hands. It's His church. He'll take care of it. And and again, the church has to be crucified. So we look back two thousand years ago, and we can ask ourselves: Did Jesus do anything about what was happening to him? He pointed things out, but then he allowed himself to be crucified. He allowed the passion to happen. He allowed the false accusations. He allowed the the the, the false uh, conviction, and 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 he willfully accepted the cross. And that's part of what we're going to have to do. So there is that balance. We personally can never ever give in to the evil, 
We cannot say that the evil is okay because it is not. We have an obligation to help others to recognize that difference because people are so poorly catechized today that they really honestly don't know sometimes what's right and what's wrong. So we can help them with that and and, and point people to the Lord. Because if, if, again, if we get caught in the bad, the negative, the whatever, the evil that's going on and the corruption, we're just going to wind up being angry and we're going to crash. So we need to look beyond it. Yes, again, acknowledge it, but look beyond it. Look at Jesus and keep the focus on him. And of course, this is his mother's time. So keep your focus on our Blessed Lady. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that some people don't really agree and, but I think is so true is that, well, actually I think most people would agree once we say it, is that it's almost better when it gets too big for me because right. it almost takes that father for, you know, when you're holding up this brick and you're holding up this brick and it's, it's too big, I can't do it. I just surrender and you let it go down. Well, that's good because I think we have this false idea that I have control. I have power. I can do something. Yes, God can do something through you, but really you can do nothing. So when it gets so big is when we actually surrender and go, okay, God, this is too big for me. You've got to do this. And God's usually like, well, thank you. Move out of my way. I've been trying to get you to surrender to me in the first place, you know? So I think that's the good or the better part of it is, and you bring up an excellent point, and, and it's it's not only the surrender, but learning dependence. We have to be dependent on the Lord, and 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 so that's to surrender everything. What we tend to do is say, essentially, I can handle this. I'll let you know if I need help. Well, guess what? We need help. 24 hours a day, we need help, and we need to be we we need to be able to have the humility to acknowledge that. And so, like you're saying, when it's too heavy, we know we can't do it. We need help. And so so it kind of automatically helps us to be able to turn everything over to our Lord because we can't do it. Well, the title of the show is, if you want the best way to prepare for the Antichrist is to save your marriage, fight for mm -hmm. your marriage. Now, people might be thinking, what? Um but you, again, you wrote the book. You're the author of um, God's plan for your marriage. You're a priest, but it, it goes so much deeper. And, you know, my mind goes to this place of where our, the very first battle, the very first battle. And, and John Clark, I was telling you about this before we went on the air, who wrote his book and I did a podcast with him um, about marriage that actually Satan in the garden was after their marriage. He wanted to break mm -hmm. their marriage up so they could break against God. So we got marriage was this first thing Satan attacked. And then our mother said to the children of Fatima, the final battle, the final battle. So the first, the final battle would be, be for marriage and the family. Mm -hmm. So again, Satan's like, attack the family, attack the family, attack the family, attack marriage. And if he can succeed at attacking marriage and winning, then he's won the bigger battle. But you know, God won't ever let him win that. And so I think a lot of people take that very careful. Uh, you watching right now, you're probably thinking, oh, here, Christine goes on her marriage thing again. But this is huge because if you're going to fight against Satan and you can't fight for your marriage, your spouse has left, he's having an affair, she's having an affair, they've divorced you and you're like, I give up. I, you know what, they can have their way. I deserve to be happy. You've just lost the battle because this battle against the Antichrist is going to be huge. And you need to be prepared by learning how to fight against wretched evil, against the, the toughest of the tough. And so saving your marriage, fighting for your marriage is going to be essential for that reason alone. But then Father, I know you actually talk about so much more like the unity so can you kind of take that any place you want why is fighting for your marriage the best way to prepare for the coming of the antichrist well there there are a couple of elements to to think about first of all it's as you pointed out the marriage and family are the area under attack right now and uh and our lady has made that very clear that that's what was going to be and so it is and so, so there's there's part of that, you know, the devil is coming after your marriage. So you have no choice to be able to, to but but to fight for it. 
It's not something you can take for granted. Well, we made the vows, so we're okay. It's like, praise God, you made the vows, but now it's a matter of how do you fight when somebody is trying to pull it apart? You need to bring the two to closer union. Marriage is first and foremost a spiritual union. You need to be praying together. You need to be building up that spiritual union, and you need to pray as a family because, again, that's where he's trying to weasel his way in and to bring division and, and cause trouble. So there, there's just that on the natural level. Remember that, that the principle that marriage is the foundation for both the church and society. So the devil knows if he can destroy marriage, he can destroy the church and society all at the same time. So rather than having to fight the church, rather than having to fight society, all he has to do is fight against marriage. And, and that's that's what he's doing and using, sadly, right now, both the church and society to almost promote some of that, which is, is really tragic. Um, the, the other aspect uh, of this to, to, to think about with, with regard to, you know, fighting for marriage as, as a way of preparing for, for the Antichrist, remember that the church is the bride of Christ. And if the church is going to be crucified, that is going to be her ultimate act of fidelity and love for her spouse. But if we do not understand the dignity of marriage, we will not be able to understand what is happening to the church as she goes through this time. And so in order to remain faithful in general, it first requires that fidelity to your marriage. So you have to be faithful to Jesus, obviously, and then you have to be faithful to your marriage. And what the, what the devil is going to try to do, and ultimately to what the Antichrist is going to do, is come up with all kinds of plausible lies. It's okay for you because. This is all right because. this You don't have to believe that because. Well, because your spouse did this, therefore it's okay for you. All these things. Well, if you have already given into some of that, then when the Antichrist speaks, you're going to say, ha ha, exactly what I believe. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. And that's, remember, what St. Paul says to Timothy, beware of preachers who tickle your ears. He said the day is going to come when people will no longer believe sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they're going to go after anybody who says what they want to hear. They'll go after fables. They'll go after anything. And, and that's where we're headed. So we have to be firmly rooted in that marriage, in that vocation, to recognize it, first of all, as a vocation. This is God's call to you. This is God's call to your spouse. This is God's way of making the two of you into saints. And if, <coughs> excuse me, if, if this is the area that's under attack, then that's the area that needs to be protected. Because, you know, if if the attack is, is happening in California, the people on the East Coast can sit back and say, yeah, that's really sad what's going on out there. Well, the people in California better be rallying around where the attack is coming in or the enemy just walks right in. So right now, we can't be sitting back saying, oh, the attack is somewhere else. No, the attack is on you, on your marriage, on your family. And, and so you have to be able to stand up and come to the defense of your vocation and of your individual marriage, as well as marriage in general, but your individual marriage, because that is so important as the means to make you, your spouse, and your children into saints. And, and so, so if the devil can break that up, and like I said, bring out his lies because you've already accepted some of them in order to justify doing whatever because of and whatnot, then he's already got you. So you have to remain firm in the truth. Even if your spouse abandons you, even if your spouse is not faithful, <laughs> excuse me. You that was my next question. So now you just keep talking because I was going to say, what if you're married to a jerk and he or she doesn't care? They don't care. So I could do this on your own. I'm moving on. I'm King Henry the Aething. I'm going to go find someone else, whether you let me or not how can that person who's been abandoned still in their minds be thinking, yeah, I, I am fighting for marriage, for my marriage? Well, you're fighting for it because you're being faithful to it. 
You know, I mean, you have to remember that that on the day of judgment, you are going to be responsible for how you lived your vows. Your spouse will be responsible for how he or she lived his or her vows. And so if your spouse is being a jerk, if your spouse is being unfaithful, if your spouse has abandoned you, whatever it is, he or she is going to have to answer to that on the day of judgment. You're going to have to answer to how you lived your vows. And so you have to be able to look at it and say, what did I promise to the Lord as well as to my spouse? And that's what I have to remain faithful to. And what a fantastic example. Just as we can look at people who've been married now for 50 years and say, thank you, what an example to our young people who don't know any sense of commitment. So too, if you're married in a very difficult situation, then thank you because you are being an example once again to people who would say things like, you deserve to be happy. And so if this isn't making you happy, you need to get out of this so that you can find someone who will make you happy. That's not what life is about. That's not the purpose of what marriage is about. Yes, we would hope that you'll be That's not even in the marriage. Bible, Father. No, no. People say that. I'm like, you find any place in the Bible where Jesus said he wants you happy, he wants you filled with joy. But he says, pick up your cross and follow right. me right. every time. And that's, that's what I always say to parents. You know, you ask them, what do you want for your children? And the answer is almost always the same. I just want them to be happy. It's like, no, we want them want to them be in saints. Heaven. That's right. We want them to get to heaven. And, you know, so it's not about happiness on earth. Remember, our lady told St. Bernadette, I cannot promise you happiness on earth, but in the life to come. And, and so, so it, yes, our life here, maybe God is asking you to be a victim soul. Maybe he's asking you to take on this tremendous suffering. If your vocation is to be married and you wind up being alone, that's a huge cross because your whole vocation, your everything in your being is directed toward this other person. So again, we're not trying to, to downplay the, this and, and, and try and suggest this is no big deal. No, this is huge. But so will your example be. Again, when we lead, read the lives of the saints, ask yourself why they're saints. Because they suffered, because they proved themselves faithful in the midst of all the trials and difficulties of life and all the things that happened to them. And we read what they did and we say, wow, now that's a saint. Well, that's what we want to be able to say about you too. And you're not going to become a saint without the cross, without the suffering. So if this is the suffering the Lord is allowing, just like we were talking about with the church, it's not just, it's not, it, it's, it's not fair, whatever you want to say, but it's the way that you're going to become a saint. And the saints had to go through all kinds of things that weren't just and weren't fair, just like Jesus did. So too for us. So we have to look beyond the natural level. Again, acknowledge it. Like I said earlier, don't, don't bury it, but look at it spiritually. What's God doing with this? He is making you a saint, and he is allowing you to do exactly what he said, let your, let your light shine so brightly before men that they will see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. They will be able to see your fidelity to your marriage. They will be able to see your faithfulness to our Lord, that, that you aren't willing to just roll over and play dead and say, well, I guess my spouse took off, so I'll go find somebody else too but rather you are staying faithful just as Jesus was faithful, just as the church is going to remain faithful to the end. So too do we have to remain faithful. And, and this is not going to be easy. Remember our Lord asked that horrible question, when the son of man returns, will he find any faith on earth? You know, so not many are going to remain faithful. Most are going to abandon the church and the teachings of the church because there's something that's easier. God's way is not easy. It's rough, it's narrow, and few they are who are on it. There is an easy way, and it doesn't lead to heaven. And so, so that's, again, the choice each one of us has to make. Are we going to follow the path of the Lord, which is going to lead us right up to Calvary? But remember, Calvary is not the end. Calvary is the means to the end. And so, so we have to, again, look beyond because if all we do is just look at what's right in front of us, it sure looks horrible. But if we can look beyond as to why are we doing this, 
it's ultimately for the glory of God, for the salvation of souls, and for our own self even to become a saint. The image that came to me, one of the images that came to me was um, going to the gym. Because mm -hmm. I, you know, I go to the gym to just try to stay healthy. And the whole idea of building muscles is tension. I've got to push against something bigger and harder. And I've got to lift so that that tension builds my muscle. And I have to do that over and over and over again. And then the weight has to get heavier and heavier to actually build those muscles. Mm -hmm. But then my strength is increased. And where people can see that with their bodies, they can see that when they're training for a marathon, let me do more miles, it hurts, I can do it. But boy, father, are we weak when it comes to spiritual and when it comes to uh, emotional pain, spiritual pain. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to lift that and we think we'll still be okay. And, and this is what I'm hearing you saying is, you know, carry that. Uh, Jesus carried his cross. You carry your cross, your muscles are getting bigger. And so this tension, if the two are one, if a husband and wife are one, and one is pulling away saying, I don't ever want you again. And then he's, or she is with someone else and you keep pulling because you want that. You're not, you're not just like letting go of it. You're just going, I'm going to keep pulling it back. Mm -hmm. That's tiring. It's exhausting. It's tear jerking. And, and it is the heaviest cross. I believe mm -hmm. most anyone will ever carry even next to the death of a child, because I've, I've talked to at least two people who said, no, my child has died. And standing for your marriage is even harder. Fighting for your marriage is even harder mm -hmm. because people reject you. People call you names. People tell you to move on. People, your spouse, your children. And that is just so, so, so difficult because you're standing against a culture and your spouse and everything. And you're really fighting against Satan. But boy, the fruit is going to be sweet because if we're talking about preparing for the Antichrist and the same people who couldn't deal with the pain of losing their spouse when all that difficulty comes are they just gonna say i'll take the chip just give me the chip i want to have i want to have groceries i want to go shopping or are they going to say i've fasted for my spouse i've i've gone without food i've endured spiritual pain and i'm stronger i'm closer to god i'm not going to listen to you that's what i get from what you're saying you know and, this and is the training you're absolutely correct that's that's exactly what happens. You know, you get, you know, you you don't necessarily see the muscles getting bigger in this case because it's spiritual, but what you're going to recognize is that the strength is building. You know, what you know, putting it into that similar context, it may be used to be that boy, if you just got the hangnail, you oh, the world is coming to an end. Well, now you can handle a whole lot more. And you didn't even know you could handle it because right. you were never tested to that level. Now you are, you can prove yourself with the grace of God. Again, you can't do it yourself, but with the grace of God, you can rise above all of this with his help. And now you know that you can face very difficult things where before you didn't know that you could because you'd never had to. And and so so it is, it's that that strength that's building and 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 the the ability to to persevere to be faithful in the midst of that difficulty when the antichrist comes and things are very difficult most people are going to to waffle they're going to say okay I'll, I'll give in and you know all we have to do is look back a few years ago and it was the fear and it was the yes. pressure and so on and how many people do you know who said oh i would never do that and there they are lined up to do whatever it was and, that and they were so, being mandated to do. Right. Yeah. And and so it's like, well, this is what I have to do. Well, you didn't have to, but that's that again, you just see where where the human weakness is there. Yeah. And so you didn't want to go, you didn't want to face getting fired from your job if you didn't right. do that. You didn't want to face not being able to buy groceries if you didn't do that. You didn't want to face. Um, I have one person I know didn't want to miss going to her son's wedding in another state. So she's like, I didn't want to do it, but I did it so I could fly into that state. And it's like, the Antichrist is going to be so much worse. And and again, yeah, you know, Father, the one thing I will add to, I'm not going to correct what you said, when you said, you, you know, you can't necessarily see the spiritual muscles growing. But what I will say, and and I think you can speak to this, is as I grow my spiritual muscles, 
my peace. I'm more covered in peace yeah. that when, you know, a family member gets traumatized or a cancer diagnosis or a death, it's just, you don't freak out. You don't mm -hmm. <clears throat> peace. And that's from exercising those spiritual muscles. Is, is that how, is that a good way of seeing it? It is. And, and also just even putting it into a different context that way, that the word compassion means to suffer with. Mm -hmm. The only people who can be truly compassionate are people who have suffered. And then you can suffer with others. And that's where that peace comes. If you know somebody who has suffered a lot, you'll find that there are two possibilities. Either they have become very bitter in their suffering, or they have this deep, profound peace that can only come through the suffering. And there's a wisdom that comes with it as well. And it's interesting because when people are in trouble, who do they go to? That person. The compassionate one. When they're not in trouble, they don't want anything to do with that person. But uh, but when they're in trouble, they go to that one because they know the wisdom, they know the peace, they know the the compassion, and and that. So so that yes, that is the way that you can see that <laughs> that the, the muscles have grown. But unlike on your body, <laughs> excuse me. What I was talking about was simply that you can't see that you're getting right. bigger muscles, but you see it in the actions and in the way that you deal with things that they that they have changed and and you can see that there's a deeper peace, there's a greater charity, there's a greater compassion, things like that. And that's what we need to get each of you viewing this to do is to realize if we are on the cusp of the appearance of the Antichrist, you will. You will want to be ready. You will want to be able mm -hmm. to handle it. And so if, you're, if your marriage is struggling, don't throw it away. Don't run from the pain. Ask God to, to help you to use that struggle to prepare you. Um, I know that our Blessed Mother said to one of the mystics, can't remember who, but we should fast on Wednesdays and Fridays to prepare mm -hmm. ourselves. And so I'm not here to self-aggrandize in any way, shape, or form, but I will say um, back in the day, I never fasted at all, except for on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. And those two days were the most miserable. I was like, what can I do? No, I'll, I'll have bread. Maybe if I can get a latte, that's a drink. That's not food. If I have a couple latte and, and the whole day, I was obsessed about food. That was, you know, a decade ago, two decades, who knows? And then when I started fasting, as I started leading these standards meetings, I was like every now and then I'd fast and I hated it and it was miserable, but I did it. And then when I heard that the Blessed Mother said Wednesdays and Fridays, I was like, you know, I can at least do Wednesdays. The point of it is it got easier as I went. It still hurts. Your stomach still growls, but your body actually also gets used to having less food. And then when we have meals, mm -hmm. I don't want these big giant portions. I'm not famished. My body has learned to adapt to going without. So a very tangible way for people watching, if you want to prepare for the Antichrist and save your marriage at the same time is learn to fast because mm -hmm. that is such spiritual discipline and physical discipline as well. Do you talk about fasting much, Father, in your... Yeah, the, you know, the fasting is is essential. It's It's that which gives power to your prayer. And if you want your prayer to, to be powerful, you need to fast. And there also needs to be the uh, uh, the, the, the almsgiving, the, the charity. You know, the three of them work together. And that's what our Lord tells us, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Those are those are the three things that, that we need. And so, so the prayer is essential, but it doesn't have the power without the fasting behind it and without the expression through the charity. So, so yes, you're absolutely correct. So almsgiving, is that tithing? It can be tithing, but it, it, it can be with your time. It can be your charity toward other people, you know, charity, not just meaning giving money, but, but, you know, giving of yourself and, and helping people with what they need. So, so the tithing is part of that, but it's, it's, it's much, much more broad than just giving money to, to the church or to a charity or something like that. It's, it's, it's really that, that giving of yourself. So preparing for the Antichrist, get stronger at praying, um, get stronger at fasting, get stronger at almsgiving, whether it's your time, talents, treasure, mm -hmm. your money, right? I mean, so right. Um, I, I listen to myself and I think this all sounds so, you know, rhetorical, like oh, that's all they ever talk about. 
yet that's really all God asks us. Again, it's that big, you're holding this rock and it's so big, it's too big for you. When push comes to shove and you feel so powerless, those are really powerful tools. And it's not just rhetorical. It's not it, just it's a, not. And, and and what you have to think about, like for instance, if 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 somebody were to say, you know what, you're gonna have to run a marathon. And you say, well, you know, when when the time comes, I'll deal with it. Well, what if the time came tomorrow? And you say, well, I can't run a marathon. I could maybe run a couple of blocks, but that's about it. It's like, well, why can't you run? Well, because I haven't trained. I haven't prepared. Well, you had plenty of warning, but you just took it as rhetorical stuff. It's like, yeah, I don't really need to listen to that. When the time comes, if you need to run that marathon, you're not going to be able to. And and so I even mentioned just in the homily this morning, I remember when I was assigned to the hospital and I would I would talk to the patients who were there for, you know, knee knee surgery, knee replacement or hip replacement. And some of the names that people called the physical therapists because they would force them to get up and walk. And the people wanted to sit down and they would say, no, keep going. And and oh, they just hated it. But of course, then when they could get out of the hospital and they could walk, they were sure grateful to the physical therapist for having pushed them. But at the time, right. they were not happy about it. And so, so we have to do the same thing. It's a dying to self. It's continuing to push forward. You know, if, if you if you want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you're not going to do that by watching TV. And nor are you going to do it just by showing up in the gym once and saying that was good enough. You, you, you have to keep building and building and building over time. And, and that's that's what happens with our prayer. That's what happens with, with the fasting, as you were pointing out. You, you adjust to it. You get used to it. You, you, you build. And, and that's exactly what, what we're doing with the, the spiritual life, is trying to build that up into greater union with Christ, greater fidelity to him, and ultimately a greater love for our Lord and, and for the people around us. So you've sit through a lot of confessions. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you about any of them. Um, you've met with a lot of couples. And if you could say, what is like the number one thing that you hear couples or individuals in their marriage say to you over and over and over again, to which in your mind, you're thinking, just do this. Th if I could shake you and make you see what I see, here's the one way I could have you fight best for your marriage. Can, is that... Is that a possibility? Do you is there well, a thing like that for you? I, I well, I can answer that in a generic way, and uh, and that is that it's always the other person's fault, and uh, and so so yes, your spouse has his or her own problems, but you've got to change yourself. You've got to look at what's going on in you, and and if all you do is point the finger at your spouse and say, well, you know, he or she needs to change this or that, which maybe that's true, they do. But once again, the question is, what am I doing? You know, am, how, am, how am I handling this? Even if my spouse refuses to change, that's still my spouse. I still have to love this person to the best of my ability. I still have to try to maintain the peace and the charity in this marriage. And if I'm waiting for my spouse to change before I'm willing to do anything, nothing's going to happen. And so... So again, remember, as I pointed out earlier, on the day of your judgment, you will be held resp responsible for how you lived your vows. Your spouse will be responsible for how he or she lived his or her vows. And, and so, so yes, you're, you're to help one another by pointing things out in charity, uh, to, to help one another to grow. But don't just point the finger at your spouse. Just remember when you look in the mirror, your spouse has to be married to you too. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's not the easiest thing. As either. you're speaking, I'm thinking of that. Cause you know, lately when I get annoyed with my husband, I'm like, Oh, and then I talk to my spiritual director. I'm like, okay, God, I want him to see all these things. What is it about me that I'm not seeing? You know, help oh. me to see first. So at least I won't feel guilty if I say, then I want him to see too, you know? Well, but I wrote my book, Father, the the super couple, a formula mm -hmm. for extreme happiness in marriage. And the formula was sacred, S-A-C-R-E-D, these extremely happily married couples. And, and it was true in every one of them. And the S stood for selflessness. And I saw that as the 
biggest thing. The husbands would surrender their needs to meet the needs of the wives and the wives would then surrender their needs to meet the needs of their husbands. So mm -hmm. both were getting their needs met because they had to surrender themselves mm -hmm. to go and meet the other. So that means surrendering your own attitudes and surrendering. It's like, no, you're the one that's a problem. It's like constantly looking at the self saying, how am I in this problem? How, mm -hmm. how could I be improving it? And to remember that when you made the vows, you gave yourself away 100% to that other person. There's no room for selfishness. There's nothing of you to take back and say, no, this is about me. It's like, no, I already gave me to another person. And I've received that other person 100% to myself. So there's nothing left for me to reject. So if you look at it that way, it's like, there's no room for selfishness in there because I'm supposed to be living for this other person because that's what I promised that person and God that I was going to be doing. So that's where it comes down to that, that point of, okay, yes, I see the problems in the other person, but am I seeing the problems in me? What can I do to adjust this and make this better? And you know, somebody a number of years ago wrote a book called How to Change Your Husband, and basically what it says is change yourself, change yourself and your husband will change with you. And, and so, so it's that, that's the reality, you know, look at what you can do differently. It's easy to see what your spouse should be doing differently. That's not the issue. The issue is what can I do differently? How can I love this person more? And, and how can I love this person better? That's what it's all about. And yes, there are maybe maybe your spouse is an alcoholic or maybe your spouse is, is being unfaithful or something. Obviously, those are things that are going to be devastating in a marriage. And so by, by how do I love this person better? I'm not saying, oh, say that it's okay to do that. No, it's not. But given the circumstances, what is God asking of you? Not to say that it's okay, because it's not. But how do you love this person in the midst of what's going on? What does that look like? Again, right. don't make. How don't did Jesus it love us like when he was on the cross? On. While what's we that? were, how did Jesus love us while he was on the cross? Exactly. And we were sinning against him. Right. We you put know, him. He didn't there. jump he off the cross anyway. and say, "I'm done with this." You right. know, he's like, "I'm going to still love you." Amidst and that's him. that's exactly what we have to do. Keep trying to love this person. And hopefully love them into conversion, love them back into the marriage. And, yeah. you know, but even if they don't, continue to love them and continue to be faithful. You know, connecting it, it's kind of like the last kind of point I'll make before we can wrap this up is this idea of the Antichrist. And I get so fed up, Father. I don't know if you hear it as much as I do, but my spouse is a narcissist. If I hear that one more time, oh, I'm that's like, everywhere these days. Everywhere, right? So I talk to people, I'm like, okay. Sure, maybe there's a medical of that, but I think it's thrown around too much. And I talk about this continuum. Like this is total selflessness, Christ. This is total selfishness, Satan. Narcissism is on this continuum. Do I think more about myself or do I think more about others? And so when I think about preparing for the Antichrist, if we're going to come full circle in the show, the further you can get away from Satan is the further you can get away from selfishness the closer you can get to Christ is being selfless. Mm -hmm. Satan is going to look for those of you who are more selfish because you're thinking more about yourself than others. And he can grip you there. Is that a good analogy or is that, is that a good way to focus? I was going to say, it's not even an analogy. It's just the simple truth. You know, every sin is an act of selfishness and, and selfishness is what's at the root of all of our problems. You, again, you go back to Adam and Eve, you know, why did you do it? Well, it was the woman you gave me. Why did you do it? Well, it was the serpent. You know, you know, we don't take responsibility for ourselves, but at the same time, we're focused on ourselves all the time. Yeah. And as I like to point out to people, hell is going to be looking at yourself for the rest of eternity. There is nothing more despicable or despairing than staring at your own self. Why would we want to spend our life doing that and preparing for an eternity of it? Instead, heaven is going to be about looking at the Lord and about loving the Lord and loving others. That's what we should be spending our time doing, preparing for heaven, because earth, our time on earth is a preparation for eternity. 
So if you're preparing by staring at yourself, oh, which place are you, well. are you preparing <laughs> right. for? So, so yes. Yeah, so the more selfish, the easier prey you are for the Antichrist, the, because he's going to tell you what you want to hear. Right. And if you want to be selfish, you're just a sitting duck for whatever it is that, that, that he's going to bring up. So, so again, learn that love for the Lord and that love for others. That's selflessness, because that's exactly what charity is. It's selflessness. So if every sin is about selfishness, charity is about selflessness. You not only want to be able to serve the Lord and get to heaven, but you want to be able to have the grace to fight against the Antichrist. Learn to say no to yourself so that when the Antichrist comes and offers you all the selfish stuff that you want, you'll be able to say no, because you know where that's going to lead. It's going to lead to eternal death, and it's going to lead to despair. And, and what good is that? I mean, look at the situation we're living in today. I mean, there are so many miserable people because they're focused on themselves. And so, so let's work on getting the, the focus off ourselves. That's what's going to bring us the peace and the joy and the happiness and so on, is when we're actually doing what we were created to do, which is to love. And love is selfless, not selfish. So, so you're absolutely spot on with that point. Well, that is a great place to end the show, Father. Um, you know, prepare for the Antichrist. Focus on others. Focus on your spouse. And in that, you're focusing on Christ. And in that, you're preparing in, in the best ways you possibly can. So I don't know if there's any other way, apart from what you just said, to answer my last question, which is always name one thing you'd have our listeners do differently as a result of something we said today. But shoot one more in there. There's <laughs> one more succinct thing to do. Well, the, the main thing is just to pray, is to spend the time in prayer. And I, by that, I don't mean saying prayers. You know, your rosary is absolutely essential. But I'm talking about the mental prayer. It's, it's to have that time, aim for, you know, you might not start at this, but aim for at least a half hour a day. <clears throat> then, then you might call it like contemplative style prayer, whatever. It's just that quiet prayer united with our Lord in the heart. That's what's going to bring the union. That's what's going to bring, again, your peace. That's what's going to bring the grace to have insight into your marriage and into all the other things. That's where you can pour your heart out to the Lord. That's, you know, so you just you just go there and you be with him. You can talk to him in your own words. You let him speak to you. And, and if there is one thing that is absolutely essential today, it is that. And as we move forward, it's going to become even more essential. And, and so just again, like running the marathon, don't wait until the night before and say, oh, I guess I better do some prayer. It's like, no, get used to it. Start doing the prayer because prayer is not easy. It's not about fun. It's not about consolations. It's about loving Jesus. That's why we're there at prayer is to love the Lord. And, and so love, as you know, from your own marriage is not always easy. And so, so as we learn how to deal with these things in prayer, then we can bring them into our lives and we bring the things from our lives into the prayer and we, we become conformed to Jesus. And that's what that prayer does. So if there is one piece in all of this to be able to, to pass along that is most essential, it is the prayer. Stop and the talking, start of listening. Course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Father Altier, you are always such a blessing. Um, you don't happen to have a copy of your book sitting there right now, do you? Uh, um, well, as a matter of fact, they do. Okay, there you go. God's plan for your marriage. What's the tagline in there? I always forget it. Um, an exploration of holy matrimony from Genesis to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Excellent book. I have it. I've read it. Get a copy. Get a copy. Save. Prepare yourself for the Antichrist by preparing your marriage. And this is good for you even if you are single, even if you are divorced, even if you are widowed. Prepare prepare, prepare. And this is marriage is vocation and learning how to sacrifice and love someone else. And that's what we need to do. So um, you can find, Father, do you still have your homilies recorded? Can people find you online anymore? They are. They're uh, Catholic Parents Online uh, is, is the, the group that puts them up. I know they've got them on YouTube. I think they have a Rumble page and some others. I don't even remember what were all they said they'd have. So them. Catholic uh, Parents Online. Catholic parents online. Okay. Is, is a, yeah. So you can get them on, on their website as well. 
Excellent. That's how I found you. That's how Father Altier came into our 2023 Truth Speakers Conference. Um, it, it was wonderful. So, and we will be uploading those videos in a minute. You can go ahead and purchase those actually, if you'd like. Um, I'm always promoting the great spe speakers that we had there. So um, I think that's it. Follow me and I, God will send me great guests and then you follow my show and I'll send the shows to you so that you can be fed and educated and um, prepared, prepared for whatever God has in store for you. So uh, subscribe, Instagram, Facebook, Rumble, uh, YouTube, and definitely for my newsletter, because sometime the censorship is going to be so real, they aren't going to let us send our stuff out anymore. You're going to need to come to us. And the best way to do it is to um, set up this, the subscriptions to all those that you follow today. So that you don't forget later. Anyway, I think that's it, Father. And I know you know how I end my show. So um, I am Dr. Christine Bacon. You've been watching Breakfast with Bacon. And I'd like to remind you always to live your life. Sunny side up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>